There are various ways of periodizing Japanese history, with the most common scheme being this one. The Heian Age, arguably the high point of what we typically think of as classical Japan, spans 794 to 1185, although that ending date's a bit muddled with some historians actually pushing it forward. It's often thought that Heian Kyo, modern day Kyoto, was the first permanent capital of Japan. This isn't actually true, though, the city of Nara holds that place of honor. What makes the city of Hyankyo special, besides giving this era its name, is that it was the seat of Japanese culture for centuries, so in order to handle this correctly, there are several different topics we need to cover. The founding of Hyankyo, imperial court culture, the Kanpaku system, the development of Shoin, gender relations, and the rise of the samurai. Let's start with the founding of the city. Prior to a permanent capital being founded at Nara, and permanent must be understood with quotation marks around it because it was only the capital for about a century, upon the death of an emperor, the Japanese capital would move. It's not entirely clear why this was, but a likely explanation lies in the fact that death pollutes in Shinto and thus makes an area unclean and thus unfit for certain actions, such as governance. In any case, the city of Heia... In any case, the city of Heijokyo, modern-day Nara, was founded in 710 based upon the Tang capital of Chang'an, meaning it was laid out in a grid. Buddhism and the imperial court were heavily intertwined in this period, and due to this connection, monasteries grew up around the city. In 794, the emperor Kamu decides to abandon it and found a new capital, first at Nagawaka-kyo, but eventually he settles on the site of what would become Heian-kyo. Whatever the reason, Heian-kyo, like the previous cities of Nagawaka-kyo and Heijo-kyo, is based on the planned model of Chinese cities. This one's much bigger though. Running about 3.5 miles from north to south and 2.5 miles east to west, Heian-kyo was something like twice as large as the previous capitals, and it was centered on the imperial palace compound, which was situated in the middle of the north end of the city, north being the special or sacred direction for the emperor as the word for the emperor, Tenno, literally means something like heavenly sovereign of the north star. And, while the city did have walls, about six feet high, it appears to have lacked gates, at least initially. Within Heian-kyo, it is to the imperial palace that we will now turn. Describing the culture of the court as refined is probably something of an understatement. In older historiography, the Heian court is usually described as something like a world unto itself, insular and completely disconnected from the rest of Japan, whose general feelings can be summed up by the phrase mono no aware, literally meaning the pathos of things, but perhaps better understood as the transience of things. Put another way, nothing lasts forever, and everything will always perish. This can seem rather depressing, and it was. You have to keep in mind here that the court was actually insular in the sense that through the aristocrats it was the center of the world, and the rest was a frightening place occupied by ghosts and spirits, so for the aristocracy, the nature and life that they were surrounded by in the court in which they saw die as the seasons moved through their cycles, impacted them very much. The older stuff got that much right, but it wasn't perhaps quite so uninvolved as works like Morris's The World of the Shining Prince seem to think, but we'll get to that in a bit. In any case, everything the aristocrats did, and I do mean everything, had some rule or regulation that needed to be followed, otherwise there would be a loss of face, and thus, shame. As this was based on the tongue model, the Heian court was broken up into something like 12 different ranks, with each rank having an upper and lower subdivision, and based on where you were placed in that system, and who your parents were, impacted the amount of respect and influence at court you had. In a word, then, birth and status determined everything. Because of that, you were allowed fans with a certain number of folds based on your rank, for instance, and clothing with a certain amount of layers based on where your social station was, and if you carried the fan incorrectly at just the wrong angle, or if the color scheme on your clothing didn't quite complement in the correct manner, then forget it, it's all over for you. Love of nature was also highly prominent here, with aristocrats liking to go out on flower viewing trips. Indeed, the Manyoshu, a collection of poems from the preceding Nara period, mainly about nature and flowers, was extremely popular in the Heian. And with that, I'd like to use the Manyoshu as a segue into the key cultural developments of the Heian. So, that collection of poetry was technically written initially in what we now understand to be classical Chinese. The style of poem is what's known as waka poetry, a distinctively Japanese style based on 31 syllables and which gained prominence in this period. It's during the Heian era, though, that the system of writing these poems changes from classical Chinese to classical Japanese, facilitated by the development of two writing systems, the alphabetic 
circular hiragana, and the more formal, more box-shaped katakana. While technically speaking, the men of the Heian were to study Chinese and would judge by their knowledge of the language, the women, again, technically speaking, were not allowed to study it, although we know that some of them did, and as a consequence, many of the pieces composed by the women of the Heian court were written in Japanese. It's in this context that we get the tale of Genji, written by Murasaki Shikibu, generally credited with being the world's first novel. It's still read today, and the atmosphere of the work is completely dominated by Mono no Aware. At play during all of this is what's generally known as the Kampaku system. Initially, Sesho, or regents, would govern Japan until the current emperor came of age, and initially, only other members of the imperial family could become Sesho. In about 866, the first non-imperial member, Yoshifusa, a member of the Fujiwara clan, the family which helped oust the Soga from power in a coup in 644 and 645, became Sesho. Ten years later, Fujiwara and Motosune formed a new position, the office of Kampaku. Technically speaking, Sesho governed in place of young emperors while Kampaku served as regent for the adult emperors, but really, there was no functional difference between the two offices. They both governed in place of the emperor. I've compiled a non-exhaustive list up until about 1500 of Sesho and Kampaku, which is based on the one located on Wikipedia with a few minor corrections of dates on my end, just to give you all an idea of how long this system lasted, and to demonstrate just how much power the northern Fujiwara branch of the family actually had, their names are written in green. Moving on to the Shoin, then. These have generally been written into the English language historiography as something akin to medieval European manners, and to a degree this comparison is not incorrect, but I would suggest that we don't push that comparison extremely far. After all, this is Japan we're talking about, not medieval Europe, so of course, some things will be different. The samurai, while comparable to a knight, is not a knight, and the same applies here. So, as an introduction to the showin, I think Kylie puts it best when he says, the Heian period was characterized by a gradual process of political decentralization. The government in the imperial capital slowly lost its hold over two crucial human resources, productive and coercive military force. By government, however, is meant the official bureaucratic structure. The nobility in the late Heian period actually had a dual role, as participants in the official government and as private landowners. The government lost a great deal of authority, the nobility, as a class, lost somewhat less. By the 10th century, tax immune landholdings and quasi-autonomous military bands were important elements in the politics of every regional area. It was during this time, moreover, that the nobility in the capital finally abandoned ideological commitment to the authority-intensive administrative system of the earlier imperial regime, and, ceasing all real attempts to eradicate local autonomy, commenced to legitimize it in the emperor's name. The Sesho and Kampaku system worked extremely well because it separated the ability to claim the right to power and the ability to actually exercise it. Hence why the Fujiwara never attempted to actually seize the throne. They didn't need to. The same applies to land tenure. Nobility who resided usually in the capital owned land out in various regions of the Japanese islands, but they did not necessarily administer it. Instead, the nobles and the central government had land stewards, whose office was generally known as the Azukari Dokoro, otherwise known as Ryoke, whose job it was to administer the land in the noble's stead. It wasn't just nobility who could own these large, privatized, and semi-privatized estates, though. Quite often in the Heian period, principal Showen owners were not the nobility, but Buddhist monasteries. Because we're talking about land systems here, I want to skip ahead and talk about the samurai before talking about gender relations as the samurai are strongly related to the showing system. Every society has systems of reciprocity and reciprocal relationships that are established to help govern social conduct, and Japan in this era was no different. The relations between court nobility and the local overseers of the showing were designed to benefit each other, as we've already gone over. In these relationships, the local lords gradually coalesce into factions, and the loyalty felt to those factions could in certain instances overcome kinship loyalties. That point is key for understanding the role of those who would become known as the samurai. Warrior groups allied themselves with these factions in the hope of gaining rewards, either land, money, titles, or something else. During this period, there were various law codes and reforms passed, one of the objectives of which was to establish a national military on a similar model to Tung China. 
At the same time that all of this is happening, bands of warriors and other people predisposed to violence begin to gather in an attempt to protect themselves from landlords and to extort those same landlords. Eventually, once the military fails, the government decides that they might try to employ these bands and see what happens. It's these groups of people, under the leadership of branches of the imperial family and other aristocratic houses, that lead the fight against the Amishi in the north of Honshu. And, though I cannot prove it, we have enough evidence that there were some Amishi hired by the Japanese that it is likely that clans descending from the Amishi were employed long term by the Japanese state. These were literally hired swords who fought for the nobles in exchange for some kind of reward. These are the people who would become the samurai, and the clans that led them would develop into buke, the warrior aristocracy. Eventually, as the shoin increased in size and number due to the encouragement of the court by about 1045, the number of warriors and their power increases as well, backed as they are by their aristocratic factions and who are in turn backed by the warriors. Conflict breaks out in the Genpei War, fought between the imperial cadet clans of the Minamoto and the Taira. Now you'll have to forgive me for skipping quite a bit of this, as to date there hasn't been a really extensive scholarly work in English on the Genpei War, so far as I'm aware, anyway. And as my Japanese is still in the learning process, I'd prefer not to bore you with an overgeneralized political narrative, much of which is likely outdated in English. In any case, I think it's worth quoting the opening lines to our main source on the war, the Heike Monogatari. The sound of the Gion Shoujo bell echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the sala flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure. They are like a dream on a spring night. The mighty fall at last. They are dust before the wind. Jian Zhukansho, written in the 12th century, takes a more secular approach, but also one which is striking. After senior emperor Toba died on the second day of the seventh month of the first year of Hogan, fighting and strife began in Japan, and the country entered into the age of warriors. So this conflict to the Japanese marked a sharp break in historical periodization, although there are some issues with this which we'll explore in the Kamakura video, and to the Japanese it was also a conflict steeped very deeply in Buddhism. This is remarkable for the course of Japanese history because it begins to mark not only the coming of age of the samurai, but also the continuing and long-term impact of and its gradual association with military conflict. The Minamoto win and it results in the destruction of the Taira clan and the creation of the first military government, the Kamakura Shogunate, but I'm going to talk more about that in the Kamakura video, as it's related much more to that era. Lastly, let's examine the gender relations. I'm not going to be giving much background on this subject as I've covered it in the preceding videos, so if you're not familiar with Japanese gender relations prior to the Heian, I would encourage you to watch the relevant sections of those. Heian aristocrats married twice. The first marriage was conducted when the bride and groom were about the same age or the female slightly older, while the second marriage was conducted later in life, while the male was older than the female. They also practiced polygamy, where men have more than one wife, and while the first wife may have been the principal one, we are not too sure on that particular point. Using the term marriage, though, might actually be incorrect here. Nobles were not married under governmental or religious auspices, it was strictly domestic. And because of this, and I'm not joking, marriages could end when the man stopped showing up home or the woman locked him out for a certain period of time. Marriage was often uxora local, meaning that the couple resided near or at the woman's family's home. This means that the children often grew up under the authority of their maternal grandfathers, which gave the older generation a tremendous amount of power over their families. Long-term family cores are, then, maternal which reflects the continued influence that women have held in Japanese society even into the so-called age of the samurai. This relationship is crucial for comprehending why Fujiwara women were married to male emperors. The imperial family could be more easily brought under the dominance of the Fujiwara due to the influence of Fujiwara grandfathers and mothers. Women have the ability to inherit property. If they divorce, they can take all that's not nailed down, and they retain their family's name at marriage, so to sum it up, in contrast to how many Western people have conceived the institution of marriage throughout history, in Japan it is the men, not the women, who are the outsiders. This has very strong implications for how the samurai will behave in the future, which we will cover in the Kamakura video. Until then, I hope you have enjoyed this, and I hope it was illuminating for you.